Howard, Howard Glazer, Deputy Director of State Operations. Uh, for this morning's briefing, we have the Governor. In addition, we have with us uh, Lisa Schultz, who is the Executive Vice President uh, for Sears, and we will shortly be joined by Robert Niblock, who is the Chief Executive Officer uh, of Lowe's. As you know, we had a second storm come through uh, last night. Um, as predicted, that storm did have additional impacts uh, throughout the region, particularly on power and to some degree on uh, the fuel distribution system uh, as well, which both of which were already challenged. At one point, we had last night over 120,000 additional outages, power outages. Uh, there's probably about a net right now of new power outages down to about 30,000. So lost some ground on power when we could least afford it last night. Uh, these are the areas that we were primarily focused on today, our power, fuel, transportation. The governor will address those. The good news about last night's storm is there was no additional new structural damage, either to the transportation system, no tunnels flooded. Uh, we did have a Long Island Railroad problem last night uh, with power during the height of the storm, but there's no lasting damage to that. Uh, we had no additional beach erosion uh, problems or significant flooding problems in those areas. So one piece of good news is that while that storm did create additional vulnerabilities for us in terms of making this recovery happen as quickly as possible, no new structural issues for us uh, that need to be addressed. Um, with that, the Governor. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Howard Glazer and the whole emergency team here, as well as all our colleagues, the uh, federal officials, the FEMA, et cetera, and the local officials have been working as one coordinated effort. All the first responders, I want to thank you very much. Let's start with the good news. The good news is that the Queens Midtown Tunnel will come online tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., uh, both tubes, uh, so it will be fully operational. Uh, there may be some breaks in the evening for some light maintenance, but the Queens Midtown Tunnel will be up and running. That leaves essentially the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which is the main transportation artery that was affected that has not yet been brought into service. I don't know how many of you came with me to s look at the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, uh, but I was there that Monday night when a river was flowing into the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. It's just the Hudson River went up over the banks, came across the West Side high Highway and filled the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And when you walked into the tunnel, now called the UL Carey Tunnel, uh, literally floor to ceiling water. It was really a, a, a sight to see. So that tunnel had extensive damage, but we're making good progress there also. But for, for tomorrow morning, Queens Midtown Tunnel, um, and that will leave just the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. In terms of power, the numbers for today, Nassau County remains uh, the, the critical point in terms of power and numbers, 108,000. Suffolk, 79,000 people without power. Westchester, 35,000 people without power. Uh, and Queens, uh, my, my home borough, 23,000 people. Uh, that, that is still an ongoing major problem. Nassau Suffolk, as you heard, took a step backwards last night with the, with the storm that added uh, insult to injury. This has been two steps forward, half step back, and last night was a half a step back, basically in Nassau and Suffolk where there was uh, an increase in the number of people who lost power once again. It's slow going in the impacted areas. What's happening now is the number is down uh, to about, besides Nassau County, we're talking about people without power in the impacted areas. The reason the progress has slowed is because in the impacted areas, you basically have to go building by building to make sure what, bu what buildings can take the power and what buildings can't take the power before you return power to that area. So that is a labor-intensive exercise that's going on now in New York City and in Nassau and in Suffolk. It requires a building inspector and an electrical inspector and a representative of the power company, and they're going literally building by building. And you have tens of thousands of people in these affected areas. So you can imagine the amount of time that it takes uh, and how extensive that is. Roughly 90% of the people who were affected have their power back. Approximately 10% of the people don't have their power back. 
besides Nassau that is primarily in the impacted areas, and that's uh, what we discussed, which is the labor-intensive period practice now of going door to door. Uh, Ninety percent sounds like uh, we made a lot of progress and that you're almost there. As I've said from the beginning, it's 90% uh, it, only matters if you have your power on and there's only one number that matters to people and that's their number and I understand that. 90% uh, is not a, a victory. The 10% who don't have power is a defeat and we will keep working and keep pushing these utility companies every day until that number is zero, period. Uh, I mean, I, I know how hard it is for these families who are struggling. I've been out there every day uh, meeting with people, talking to people, trying to comfort people, but it has been long and it has been hard. And if you have kids and if you're in a house that was damaged, not having power makes the situation intolerable. You have people in public housing who've been trapped basically in the public housing. They're in the upper floors. Uh, they can't walk down. Uh, the condition of the buildings uh, is not great. Uh, so I, I fully understand and we are doing everything that we can possibly do. And I, I know that doesn't give uh, comfort, but I just want people to know it's not for a lack of effort. Uh, and we'll learn from this as we go forward. On gasoline, the, as we said, the system is coming together slowly. The storm last night did uh, set us back. It set us back in the scheduling of tankers that were coming in because people were anticipating the storm. And the power outages uh, aggravated the situation, especially on Long Island, because part of the problem are gas stations without power. They have gasoline in the tank, but they don't have power, so they can't pump. To the extent you had more power outages on Long Island, that made a bad situation worse. Uh, on the gas supply, it is a varied picture in the region. Uh, there is no one story. It's one situation in New York City, which tends to have longer lines. Nassau and Suffolk now, because of the power outages and especially because of the storm last night, they probably have uh, a worse problem. Westchester, it's not as bad. Rockland, it's not as bad. Orange County, it's not as bad. So it is different depending on where you are. And that's why you'll get different stories from people uh, on this issue. Some people will say, well, there's no problem at all where I live. Because it is different from county to county. I've been working with all the county executives and with the mayor to come up with a coordinated plan. Even though it's a different problem in different counties, it's important that we stay coordinated because I don't want one, what one county does affecting a neighboring county. So I'm working with the mayor and the county executives to stay coordinated on whatever plans uh, that we come up with. I want to thank the National Guard, which, is con which has continued to be deployed, and I'm going to continue to deploy them at the same levels. They, in many ways, have been the backbone of this operation. They've been in every community. They have done an outstanding job under very difficult circumstances. Uh, they're now distributing goods, food, and donations, uh, and providing stability in a lot of neighborhoods. And they've been the backbone, and I thank them very much. State police, we've redeployed additional state police from upstate to downstate to relieve the local police department to do emergency operations with the state police coming in to provide public safety. We've said before, and I just want to urge people once again, we made arrangements with the private insurance companies. We made arrangements with FEMA. You don't have to keep uh, household goods or damaged goods to prove anything for the insurance company. Take a photograph of the goods and dispose of them. Uh, just getting the debris out of the communities is very important. Uh, it's dangerous. It's a health hazard. If we have another storm like we had last night, high winds, we don't want a lot of debris uh, blowing up and down the streets, creating additional uh, projectiles for a storm. Take a picture. You don't need a professional photographer. Take a picture on your, on your cell phone. Keep an inventory. The insurance company will accept that. We regulate the insurance companies. We pass that order. Put the debris out. I've said to the local governments, I want the debris picked up quickly. It's a public health emergency. 
we will reimburse the local governments through FEMA for the collection. But uh, to homeowners, get the debris out, let the local authorities pick it up, and to the towns and the cities, uh, I want them to focus on it as a priority. The first cost estimate that I have seen has suggested that this storm will cost the region $50 billion in damage and economic loss. State of New York, about $33 billion in damage and economic loss. That is a staggering number, especially with the financial situation that we've been, we've been in. I've worked for two years to close deficits, $10 billion deficit, uh, which was all the money in the world. Uh, we're looking at an additional $1 billion deficit on the state side, maybe higher after what's happened. Uh, and that was a tremendous undertaking to balance the budget uh, with that situation. So the $33 billion is a lot of money, even for a state government, a federal government. And I think it's this entire situation, if there's going to be a silver lining, it's, there is a lesson for us to learn here. And the lesson is uh, extreme weather, I believe, is here to stay. Climate change is a reality. We can have a great political argument about the causes. I want to pass that step. That political argument has gridlocked us from moving forward for too long. It's undeniable, but that the frequency of extreme weather conditions is up. And we're going to have to learn from that. And that's going to be the next chapter of this situation. Uh, we're going to get through the emergency. We're going to get through the immediacy. And then we have to start to ask some tough questions and work our way through it. First question is going to be, what should we rebuild, where, and how? Uh, maybe Mother Nature is telling us something uh, one time, two times, three times. Uh, there are places that are going to be uh, victimized by storms. We know that now. Well, what is the technology? What is the construction technique to build in those areas? Other parts of the country that have a uh, higher frequency of floods and storms, they build differently. Uh, I've seen it myself when I was at HUD, there's just different construction techniques in, techniques in different parts of the country. Uh, that's something we're going to have to consider here. Where we rebuild and where we don't rebuild uh, is going to be something that we look at. The overall vulnerability of this region to floods and storms. When we designed and built New York, we did not think of floods and storms because we didn't have them. Uh, though they happened in other parts of the country. We didn't have hurricanes, and we didn't have floods. So we built the New York that we now have. Uh, what made Manhattan Manhattan was not just what we built up, but what we built down. It wasn't just the high rises. It was the infrastructure under the city, 15, 20 stories below the surface. That's where the subway tunnels are and the water tunnels and the electric tunnels. Brilliant engineering masterpiece, yes. But if Manhattan floods, you then fill up that infrastructure. And as we learned the hard way, we don't even have a way to pump out all that water once you flood that infrastructure. So it's going to be a rethinking, redesign of how we protect this metropolitan area from this increased frequency. And there's going to be another question which is how do you harden our systems? Uh, we have systems that are also very vulnerable. Our transportation system is vulnerable. We learned that the hard way. Our fuel delivery system is vulnerable. All these delays, this is only because there was a two or three day lag in supply. Look at the lines, and that's just from two or three days uh, delayed supply. This is a tremendous vulnerability. Uh, these systems are the circulatory system of the region. And you stop the circulatory system and you paralyze the region. And it can be transportation, it can be fuel delivery, it can be communication, but these systems must be hardened. So it's not just the storm. The storm is gone. The water has receded. The power's not on, the gas isn't flowing, and those 
hardening of the systems, protecting the systems is going to be a part of this. But that's going to be the next chapter, although we have to start to think about it now. One of the other silver linings in this situation has been how people have come together, how New Yorkers have come together, as only New Yorkers can, uh, has been the outpouring of support from people all across this country. I run into people who just came from everywhere just because they saw New Yorkers suffering on TV and they wanted to be here. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, and our corporate citizens have also been uh, generous and kind and forthcoming. Uh, and we didn't even need to ask in most cases. They stepped forward to be helpful. And we have two with us today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce from Lowe's, the Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Robert Niblock. Uh, Lowe's has already donated over $1 million to the Relief Fund. They want to be a partner in the reconstruction. They've been very aggressive and generous. Uh, Mr. Niblock himself is here to, to tour the area today. And uh, with that, let me introduce Mr. Niblock to say a few words. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for having us here today. Um, certainly, uh, first and foremost, uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, all the citizens that were in affected by just the unprecedented, unprecedented devastation that the uh, that the storm caused. Uh, as the governor said, you know we're trying to do our part from Lowe's standpoint uh, to help with the relief efforts. Uh, the million dollars that he talked about that we announced last week. Numerous other efforts underway. Uh, we're channeling half of that money through the American Red Cross. All of our stores are official donation sites for the American Red Cross, as well as our, as well as our website, so that we can collect money and, and channel it back into the local uh, communities. But even beyond, above and beyond that, uh, what our employees are doing to step forward uh, and the dedication and perseverance that they're showing is really uh, quite remarkable and unbelievable at, 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 to what they're doing to try and help the communities get uh, back on their feet. And in many cases, those employees, our own employees, have had uh, substantial losses of their own, their own property, their own homes, uh, those type of things. I was just uh, governor in our Rosedale, New York store this morning. Uh, that was a store that uh, last week uh, took on about four feet of water. Um, the water has receded from the store. We've got a phenomenal manager there, uh, Erica Kahn, who has got her team assembled, uh, working around the clock to do, do everything we can to get all the damaged product, product out, to um, uh, get new product in, and we hope to have that store back open for business uh, by the latter part of next week so that we can help with those rebuilding efforts uh, across the uh, communities that are, that are impacted. And we've got a whole team of people that have come from other stores to help uh, in that effort alone. So uh, across all of our stores in the area, we have similar relief efforts going on where we're doing everything we can trying to get emergency supplies in, relief supplies, those type of things uh, to help with the rebuilding efforts because the, the, the devastation, destruction is just uh, so massive and we're glad to be here to do our part. So thank you, Governor, for thank recognizing you. us. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Niblock. Uh, we have from Sears, uh, the Executive Vice President, Lisa Schultz. Sears has sent five truckloads of material to the region, uh, shovels, gloves, buckets, all sorts of rebuilding material, uh, cleanup material. Uh, Mr. D'Ambrosio, who is the CEO of uh, President of Sears, I spoke to yesterday myself. He'll be coming to the region to tour firsthand the damage so he can see how Sears will help. Um, we thank them very much for their generosity. And with that, let me introduce Lisa Schultz. Hi. Um Sears has always, um, the history of Sears is really to be part of the community and our efforts here um, are very important to us. We've already provided over five million to all the devastated areas, a million and a half dollars to New the New York and New Jersey area. Um, like the governor said, we've brought truckloads of supplies that include diapers. We have comforters coming, um, um, chainsaws, dehumidifiers, things that Sears can help provide. We also are partnering with Rebuilding Together and the Governor's Office to pres to um, preserve the affordable home uh, to preserve affordable home ownership and um, and we're also working with the Red Cross in our stores to collect um, from our customers in addition to collecting from our vendors. So um, overall, we also have had many employees that have been affected um, adversely and. 
pulling together as a community to help them is really important to us. So we're happy to be here and we're happy to be able to participate. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so to all the corporations, uh, we need help. Remember, this is not going to be a short haul. This is going to be a long haul. We've been focusing thus far on just the emergency situation, just the stabilization situation, uh, keeping people stable, getting people back in their homes. There's going to be a whole second phase, which is a long-term reconstruction. Uh, and that's not going to be days or weeks. That is going to be months and months. These are entire communities that need to be rebuilt. Uh, commercial centers, uh, housing, residential communities, transportation systems. So we need help and we need it for the long term. Uh, and I thank Sears very much and I thank Lowe's very much for stepping forward and I encourage others. Questions? As I said, Zach, there's going to be different solutions for different counties, I think. This is not a regional problem at this time. Well, it is a regional problem, but there are different situations in different counties. Uh, Long Island is one situation. Even Nassau, frankly, is a little different than Suffolk. Uh, New York City is a third. Westchester, Rockland, Orange. Uh, and there are different alternatives, different chief executives are considering. Some are considering rationing, con some are considering odd even, some are considering different hours, uh, some are considering gas can lines, some are considering no gas can lines. <coughs> what I want to make sure is uh, I keep them all coordinated so whatever measures anyone puts in is complementary of the regional effort uh, and not contradictory, right? You have neighboring uh, localities. If Nassau puts in one set of rules and Suffolk puts in a different set of rules, that would not be good. Um, so I understand that we have individual circumstances and individual problems, but I just want to make sure the solutions are complementary and they don't uh, compete. And that's what we're doing. So I'm, I've been chatting with, uh, I spoke with M Mayor Bloomberg, uh, all the county executives just about on what they want to do, and now we're trying to coordinate them so we make sure anything actually works for the entire region. Well, Edmund Gannon was on TV this morning saying he thinks it's moving, it sounded like, to odd-even rules. Is that correct? In your opinion, should Suffolk move in tandem with Nassau on odd-even? If Suffolk, well, first, um, I'm working with the county executives, and, and, and their opinion is relevant. Uh, as I said, I'm I'm going to make sure any situation works for the entire region, and I'm not going to allow any one of them to do something that would compromise a neighbor, because we're all neighbors. Um, Nassau and Suffolk have a worse problem after last night, in my opinion. And I spoke with the county executive, and that was basically the thrust of the conversation. The storm last night hurt Long Island again. Um, again, on the power outage side, many of the gas stations, especially in Nassau, there's gasoline in the tank in the ground, but there's no power to run the pump, and that's been the problem. To the extent that has been a problem, it got worse last night. Um, so what Nassau does definitely impacts on Suffolk. Suffolk right now has a 10-gallon rationing limit, which Nassau didn't have. To the extent we can synchronize Nassau and Suffolk, uh, that is a good thing. How, how is your Massachusetts, Delaware, Connecticut plan working on Long Island? Have those shipments come They in? are bringing in. We have facilitated, you know, the whole, the fuel system delivery or the delivery system for fuel, however you want to say it, is, I believe, one of the uh, points of severe vulnerability. I mean, look how fast you can shut down the region just by shutting down the pumps. And many things shut down the pumps, as we learned the hard way. Power outage shuts down the pumps. Storm shuts down the pumps. A broken pipe shuts down the pumps. Remember during Katrina, everybody watched that one pipe at the bottom of the Gulf spewing the oil? And you said to yourself, you know, how can this be? How can one broken pipe wind up causing so much damage? One or two broken pipelines 
in the metropolitan area and fuel delivery will shut down, greatly inhibit, the entire metropolitan area. And there's no government involvement to speak of in this fuel system. It's all private and it's all components. Terminals, tankers are one piece, terminals are another piece, pipeline is another piece, fuel delivery trucks is another piece, gas station ownership is another piece, and they're all different private owners. So um, that, that system, I think, is one of our great vulnerabilities. Uh, and it's, it's one of the places that's going to have to be hardened. But how does the Massachusetts and Delaware? Yes, yes, yes we have. Are we getting gas? Yes, we have. Island? We have waived all sorts of regulations. We've worked with the neighboring states. The president has been very helpful in waiving, uh, getting states to cooperate in the waiving of regulations. So we're bringing in more gas and by tanker, and it is arriving. It is arriving? Yes. It, arrived. it, both. It has and it is arriving. One of the compounding problems, which I've mentioned before, is the panic, which is worse in the city, uh, not as bad in Westchester, Rockland, Orange, because it feeds on itself. Westchester, Rockland, Orange, you don't have long lines. When you don't have long lines, people don't panic. When people don't panic, they don't increase their purchasing. Right now, in some areas, we're buying more gasoline than any usual consumption pattern because people want a full tank of gas, always, because they're nervous, and I understand that. But that is actually compounding the situation. I know Obama's been busy, but how is that? You talked about his, uh, you said you had spoken to him the other day about a Northeast supply. How has he, he has been, been very helpful, and yes, he's been busy, but I'll tell you he's been available to us. I spoke to him again last night. Um, just as an update, we went through the checklist of things we're working on together, but his expediting the state restrictions on transfers uh, has made the situation better. We haven't caught up yet. It got worse on Long Island last night because of the storm. Panic buying, hoarding, call it what you want. They're not polite words or attractive words, but um, that is actually compounding the situation more so in New York City. So it's more of a New York City, Long Island, problem, if you ask me right now, than a Westchester, Rockland, Orange, nor northern suburbs. Uh, you have said that you would hold the, the power companies accountable you know, for their response to the storm down the road. With regard to Lyta and Long Island, what specifically can you tell us that you're doing to help Long Island? We are working hand in glove with Lipa, and really the provider on Long Island is National Grid, uh, with the local towns to uh, facilitate getting the power back on. The obstacle that we now face is primarily in the impacted areas and primarily when you have 60 to 100,000 homes in the impacted areas. Um, how do you go through 60 or 100,000 homes in that large an area doing a home by home, building by building inspection and do it quickly? So we're literally putting together inspectors from various areas. We're taking uh, inspectors from upstate New York and bringing them down to put together a large enough crew to do this number of inspections quickly. Uh, we were working with them, we have been, to get crews from all across the country. And now as other utilities are slowing down their demand because they've made more progress, we're redeploying those crews. But uh, to me, the, you want to talk about one of the areas on the lessons learned and one of the systems that has to be hardened. The utility system we have was designed at a different time for a different place. This is a 1950s system with these utilities that are regulated by the state theoretically, uh, but they are bureaucracies that are in many ways a monopoly. There are very few incentives, very few sanctions. Uh, in some ways, they, there's little coordination. In a situation like this where you have an emergency, uh, they wind up competing with each other for materials, for personnel. So it's a system that just doesn't work uh, for New York when you in an emergency crisis situation. Do you think it would be, help, it would be helpful if you went out there and told what was going 
I've spoken to everyone. And I have been out there. I have been out there many, many times. I have been out there many, many times. I've had many, many conversations. I, communication is not an issue between me and uh, LIPA and National Grid, that I can assure you. They have heard me very clearly. Uh, I've been accused of many things in my life and criticized on many levels. No one has ever suggested that I lack a uh, essential communication skill or have been indirect in my communication and utterly uh, uh, too subtle or too nuanced. I have not been, in that, or not physical enough. Now, I've never been accused of any of those things. What would happen? Are you satisfied that they brought enough people from around the country, every, every lineman, every electrician, that, that they've utilized? Enough manpower? Are you satisfied? I don't believe, my personal opinion, and I want to do a thorough uh, accounting of this when we're done and we have uh, a sober look at cold facts and everyone has a chance to be heard. I believe they were unprepared. I believe the system is archaic uh, and is obsolete in many ways. So uh, no, I don't believe what they did was adequate. I don't believe it was right. Uh, I believe part of it is the system design and part of it is just their performance. And part of it is the fact that these utilities are a monopoly. They are basically one of the last monopolies. You know how people criticize government and they say it's just big and it's bureaucratic and it's not accountable? Government is actually accountable, at least to this extent. You can fire the person who runs it. They run for re-election. You're unhappy with the state government, you fire me. That's what happens. You're unhappy with the city government, you fire the mayor. You're unhappy with the utility company, who do you fire? By the way, who is a utility company? Who runs it? Who owns it? What is it? Where do you get them? They're this nameless, faceless bureaucracy that is a monopoly that operates with very little incentive or sanction. The costs are set by the state but are a function uh, of what they spend. So I think this is a system that we're going to have to look at a, a ground up redesign. We have, we are, they are bringing in more linemen. Um, we're bringing linemen in from all across the country. We're redeploying from other utilities. I think it is a management issue. You know, part of it is the personnel, the person, they'll say it was the personnel. Personnel are now coming in. I think it's a management. And I think it's LIPA and it's National Grid. What happens if, if, if they, I want to get some more people. Maria? I just want to follow up on her for one minute, okay? Uh, what happens if MDOT stops? What happens if FEMA only pays 75% of the utility costs in terms of sandy damage? Would you allow LIPA to raise utility rates, or would you somehow oppose that? I'm, first, I'm going to oppose. If FEMA thinks they're only going to pay 75% of damages, I'm going to oppose that. And that's going to be the first point. I believe they have to pay 100% of the damages. If they think any local government or any taxpayer in this state uh, can pay any more for this storm, uh, they are wrong. So uh, I think 100% reimbursement is uh, what we deserve and what I'm going to fight for and what I'm going to ask our congressional delegation to fight for, our congressmen and our senators. We pay a lot in taxes to Washington. Uh, this is a very important state nationally and uh, I want the respect for our taxpayers. The, the worse it goes on, the longer it goes on, it's worse. And this compounds itself. You know, and it's one thing to ask people to be inconvenienced for two or three days. It's one thing to say, well, you know, it was a terrible storm, we weren't ready. Uh, but this is just, it is unacceptable. And it is getting worse because people's suffering is worse. Uh, that's why it's more frustrating the longer it goes on. Move up to the first, Rich. Come on. <laughs> we saved you a seat, Rich, and you didn't even take it. Governor, two, two questions, if I can get two questions in here. One is, uh, would you favor legislation to make it mandatory to put uh, auxiliary power in every gas station uh, and in, in the state? And the other one is, can you tell us whether uh, the damage to the Queens Midtown Tunnel was 
a little bit less than might have been expected, or did they just uh, act more quickly, or if you could have that level of detail? Yeah, the, uh, on the, Rich, on the mandatory generators for gasoline stations, I want to see the numbers. I want to understand the cost. I want to make sure we're not going to raise the cost of gasoline in the state because we said the uh, companies have to buy generators. But um, subject to that, yes, I think uh, every gas station should have a backup generator, period. You can't, because literally any power outage, that's one of the lessons. Power outage, you paralyze the nation and chaos ensues. Literally chaos. The anxiety goes up, chaos ensues. And now you have a real problem on your hands uh, with this kind of density. So yes, I want to make sure before I say that in cement, though, Rich, they don't, the companies don't say, fine, we're going to raise gas five cents a gallon now because we have an excuse because we have to buy a generator. Uh, I think uh, they should be able to pay for it and not affect the cost of gasoline. But that's one of the things I would think. Queens Midtown Tunnel uh, was damaged. There is still damage in the Queens Midtown Tunnel but more to the systems, the lighting system, et cetera. Uh, and what they're going to work on doing is uh, allow it to operate. You'll notice when you go through it, there's only partial lighting, for example, and they're going to continue to do repairs while the tunnel is operating. The Brooklyn Battery Tunnel was the tunnel that was uh, really damaged and uh, had taken in a lot of water. Um, and um, that's, that's the one that they're still working on. Any projection on when that might? Uh Not at this time. But soon, Rich, soon. Trevor, just a question. The, the Senate Democrats are claiming that they have uh, enough seats now for a majority. I'm curious your take on that, and does the IDC now hold the keys to power? You know, I think, uh, Zach, I haven't, in their politics, first, um, I'm the governor. I head the executive. There were then two branches. They had the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, and they'll pick their leadership themselves. I haven't gotten involved in a leadership uh, dispute or debate, um, and the Assembly will pick a leader, and the Senate will pick a leader. Um, and I have no intention of getting involved in either situation. Uh, on the Senate, it's more complicated than it used to be, I think, and it was just Democrats and Republicans, and whoever had more won and controlled. Uh, now there are, it's more of a coalition, because there are three groups in, instead of just two, and they come to an arrangement among themselves, and that arrangement, whoever gets two out of three winds up winning, right? Um, so that's what they'll be going through, my guess, over the next couple of months, while they're also deciding some of the elections aren't decided. So they'll be going through uh, actually counting ballots to see how many won, and then what's the new governing coalition going to be. Yeah, no one is going back. You know, I think they learned the hard way. The Democrats were in power. The Democrats then lost power because of the dysfunction. And I think they learned that lesson the hard way. Last one, Ted. Uh, one more, more back. Ted. Even if you sit in the third row, right? <laughs> 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 um, when you're talking about rebuilding transportation networks, um, and that presumably is going beyond The, uh, I'll ignore the second question as my first answer. <laughs> On my first answer to your second question, no, I think um, first rebuilding the transportation. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. My point is um, there is a wake-up call here and there is a lesson to be learned. There, was a, there is a reality that has existed for a long time that we have been blind to. And that is climate change, extreme weather, call it what you will, and our vulnerability to it. Um, the, it was true 10 years ago, it was true five years ago, it is undeniable today. Once you accept that reality, that this could happen again, $33 billion, loss of life, weeks of inconvenience, weeks with the city paralyzed, um, the question is, 
how do you do your best to make sure it doesn't happen again or reduce the damage if it does? And looking at the systems, if you will, are very important to me. And then transportation system is one of those systems. I'm not saying we're going to rebuild the whole transportation system. How can you, what modifications, changes, redesigns can you make to harden, quote unquote, these systems, whatever harden means in that context for that system? Um, and that's going to be a long discussion with a lot of very smart people who are, who are engineers and well-versed in these construction techniques and know much more about it than I do. But that's going to be the question. Not how do you rebuild the transportation system, how do you modify, redesign this system so it's not as vulnerable as it is today? And I guess I'm asking, is that a, a challenge for the, the authorities that exist? For, the, for an MTA that has $40 billion in debt, are they going to find a way well, to... Well, Ted, look, part of this is... I hear you. But part of this is, that's not my... Uh, part of this is, it, it gets back to Kathy's question. I expect 100% reimbursement from FEMA, and you're right. The FEMA reimbursement is for costs out of pocket. Uh, I would hope that we could have a supplemental appropriation by the federal government that would understand the damage that was done here and could provide additional funding for the uh, economic impact that we've suffered. There have been there's a long history of uh, disasters to parts of this country where the people of the country have done a supplemental appropriation and come up with funding to help that region get itself back together. Uh, and I would, I think that's something that we should uh, look to here also. Last one. Can you give us a sense, when you speak with like the officials, um, can you just give us a sense of their mindset? Are they defensive when they talk to you? Are they mortified? Are they terrified? What's I think all of the above. Yeah. I think all of the above, because I have had the full range of conversations that you can have. Uh, so I think it's all of the above. Frightened, frustrated, embarrassed. Look, you can't be any stronger or harsher than I have been on the utility companies. You can't. You can't use any language uh, publicly. You can't use any other language than I've used, uh, and uh, I not have to worry about my uh, daughters watching the broadcast, right? Uh, privately, I have used language that my daughters couldn't hear. So um, they've gotten the message. Now, they have an inability to respond, and that is par partially personnel material, by the way. One of the frustrations for the utility companies is they ran out of material. They ran out of poles, believe it or not. They ran out of poles. You know, poles are something that a utility company would want to have, you would think, right? You look at what a utility company does, it basically comes down to wire and poles and crews and trucks. These are things you would want to have. How can you run out of poles? You know, During and, this, the, this yeah. and then we have utility companies competing with each other to find the poles, the way we competed to find crews and equipment. So. Part of it is the system, but I also believe with LIPA, part of it is just the management and the performance, which has been unacceptable. And they failed. They have failed the consumers. The management has failed the consumers. It is that simple. And that's my position. You know, when you don't pay your bill, you failed as a consumer. You failed as a subscriber. You didn't pay the bill. You failed in your obligation and in your contractual agreement. They have an obligation too. And they had a contractual agreement too. And they failed in their agreement because they were supposed to perform and they were supposed to be prepared and this is what they get paid to do. You know, at one point, you pay a person for a service. They were specialized in doing this. And we paid them and we gave them a franchise because they represented themselves as experts at doing this. And they failed. And they should be held accountable for their failure. In the meantime, they should be doing everything humanly possible to improve their performance and get these people out of the pain and the suffering that they've been subjected to. And we're working on both fronts. Okay, thank you very much.